Welcome to Nature Calls, Conversations from the Hudson Valley. Our team's goal is to present science-based information about gardening and all things nature in New York's Hudson Valley. Host Gene and Tim, along with team members Teresa and Linda, are master gardener volunteers for New York's Columbia and Greene counties. So if you're interested in gardening or nature or nuggets of information about what's happening outside your door, settle in. Enjoy the conversation. Whatever the season, we have something to say. Hi, I'm Tim Kennelty. And I'm Jean Thomas. And welcome to Nature Calls, conversations from the Hudson Valley. Jean, what's on our program today? We've got some cool stuff going on. We do, on. don't we? Mm -hmm. Yeah. In Teresa's veggie patch, we're going to talk about how to extend your veggie season. Yeah, Teresa's going to talk about extending the growing season, which is great because we have a fairly short growing season here. It's getting longer with climate change, but we do have a short growing season. And you want to get that last couple of things out of the garden. And she's got all kinds of gear that you can use to extend the time. Like floating row covers, which I've never used, but I know are really helpful. Oh, I and have, and it's wonderful. Cloches, which I love that I word. adore cloches. Yeah. So that's a really important thing. If you want to grow more crops and you want to have them throughout a longer season, there are great methods, and Teresa's going to talk about that. And she'll tell you what a cloche is. She will. Not she telling. will. She will. We're not telling. So what about cover-up? What are we talking about on the cover-up? Your favorite. What's that? How not to grow bindweed and why not to grow bindweed. Well, bindweed is in the same kind of family as the cover-up we're talking about, which is morning glories, right? Yep. Morning glories are gorgeous. They are. And people think that the wild morning glories are gorgeous until they try to eat their yard. Yeah, and the roots of those go down for several feet, I think. They're really hard to get rid of. But that's really not what we're talking about. We're talking about the domesticated morning glory that come in a lot of different colors and are really nice annual vine. And we explain the difference. Yep. And the cover-up for the ground cover part is sedums, one of my favorites. I like sedums, too. There's both native and non-native sedums. Mm -hmm. And they're cactus wannabes. They are. They're succulents. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, they're, they're great. Low to no maintenance. They come in a whole rainbow of color and shapes. And they come back pretty reliably. They're good, good, nice cover-up plant. And they're a great kid plant. Hens and chicks are yeah. absolutely wonderful yeah. to play with. Well, I guess I'm a kid then because I like hens and chicks too. And then Linda Levitt's going to talk about flower power again. She's got an episode of flower power on some fall blooming plants. And they're all composites, yep. I believe. They're very similar flowers if you look at them really close. Asters and mums and Montauk daisies. And how to tell the difference between the annual and the perennial mums. So when you get a mum at the market and stick it in the ground, you're always surprised that it doesn't come back next year. Well, now you'll know why. And asters are a great flower because they bloom late. They're a great nectar flower, but they're also a host plant for a lot of different butterflies. So asters, you can't go wrong with um, New England asters. And they're mostly natives. They so are. that's always they a are. bonus. Yeah. Yeah. So that's going to be great. There's a lot of flowers that bloom into, you know, October, even some blooming in November. So it's talk about extending the growing season. It's extending the growing season for pollen. And Linda's favorite daisy in the whole world is a Montauk daisy. A little bit difficult for our region, but she manages to grow it. And I think if you have kind of a microclimate, you can do that. They bloom very, very late. They're gorgeous. Right. So if you've got a little spot where you can keep it a little bit warmer or there's more sun for longer into the year. So handle with care and treat cautiously. But if you've got a good spot for them, they are awesome. That's how I describe you, handle with care and treat cautiously, I think. You're wiser than your years, Tim. It's going to be a great show. We're going to enjoy it. It's time once again for the Veggie Patch, a segment about edible gardening. I'm Teresa Golden, a Master Gardener volunteer for Columbia and Greene Counties. And today, let's cover the many ways you can extend the gardening season in both the spring and the fall. The option that will be best for you depends on the weather pattern in your area, what you're trying to keep growing, and your personal garden layout. Before selecting the best option for your Veggie Patch, 
think about what's needed to extend the season. A key requirement is to keep the soil warm. Most plants stop growing as the soil temperature drops. Mulch and row covers can help to keep your soil temps warmer longer. Another option to consider is raised beds, as the soil in raised beds tend to stay warmer longer in the fall and warm up sooner in the spring. We've talked many times about knowing your hardiness zone, which provides information on the average first and last frost dates. Vegetables that are hardy annuals can withstand a frost. These include broccoli, cabbage, peas, turnips, and kale. Half-hardy veggies like beets, carrots, radishes, and cauliflower can take a light frost. For more tender plants, maintaining an appropriate soil temperature is fundamental to extending your gardening season. Thus, make sure to keep an eye out for frost warnings so that you have time to cover your crops to prevent potential damage. Covering plants will raise a temperature in their immediate vicinity. Cloches can work for individual plants, but row covers might be best for raised beds or larger gardens. The availability of natural sunlight is another key consideration. How many cloudy days do you have versus sunny ones? As the days shorten in the fall and winter months, the reduced sunlight will limit which vegetables might be feasible to attempt to extend. You might have to plant fall crops 10 to 14 days earlier to ensure there is enough sunlight to allow them to fully ripen. And don't forget about wind exposure. In certain areas, some gardening season extenders, like hoop houses, may require a fence or a building to act as a windbreak. So, let's talk about options from smallest to largest. If you're trying to protect a small number of individual plants, you could consider using cloches. A cloche was originally a bell-shaped glass dome that provided a mini greenhouse environment for a single plant. Today, anything that fits over the top of plants without bending them can work as a cloche. Note that they use sunlight to warm the soil within the dome. That heat can build up very quickly, so cloches need to be well ventilated, especially on sunny days. Regardless of what you choose to use as a cloche, make sure that it doesn't blow away in the wind. And you will quickly discover that this approach typically works well for a small number of relatively small veggie plants and herbs but will become time-consuming in a larger garden and most likely won't help with larger tomato plants. Cold frames are another option. They are bottomless boxes covered with glass or plexiglass. They can be built from lumber or simply by arranging bales of hay in a rectangle with an opening covered by an old window or glass door. Cold frames should have a southern exposure, with the back of the frame angled to increase light absorption and to shed rainfall and snow. These structures can also heat up quickly even on a mild sunny day, so consider hinging the lid to easily open it for ventilation and temperature management. Cold frames are great for getting an early start on cool season crops, hardening transplants prior to planting and extending the harvest. For larger gardens like raised beds, consider floating row covers or low hoop tunnels. This method uses a light, gauze-like fabric that simply floats on top of the plants. These are available in a variety of weights that can add about 2 or 8 degrees of protection. This means that if a freeze at 32 degrees will kill your plant, you can keep it alive as the temperature approaches 24 degrees. A light row cover can be used for insect protection year-round, too. The material allows light and air to penetrate and even lets rain and melting snow drain through and water the plants. Heavier row material can also be placed on hoop supports to add stability and offer protection from moderate snow loads. The frame of these low tunnels can be made from a wide number of materials, including fencing wire, chicken wire, or even slender green branches or saplings. Make a long, sturdy, narrow tunnel and then cover it with anything from plastic sheeting to recycled old shower curtains, to any other waterproof material you have on hand. The plastic is stretched over the hoops and then buried or weighted down on the sides and ends. Since they are narrow and low to the ground, hoop tunnels can handle heavy snows and strong winds relatively well. However, you'll have to remove the covering to harvest your crops, ensure adequate ventilation, and adjust for any heat buildup and soil moisture. 
They can extend the growing season, but typically only work well for relatively short plants. For larger plants and a larger investment, you might consider a high tunnel or a mini greenhouse. Hoop houses can protect your plants, even larger ones, from frost and thus potentially extend your growing season by an additional six to eight weeks. Just like low tunnels on warm days, you need to keep the hoop house ventilated by lifting the ends or other openings in the covering. You can bend lengths of PVC pipe over your garden bed and then cover the whole thing with plastic sheeting. The ends can either be staked down or held down with bricks. You can decide how tall to make the hoop house. If you have a little money to invest, taller hoop houses really help extend the length of your growing season. These mini greenhouses can be easily lifted off a garden bed, moved to a different location, or taken down in the summer. Because you can walk inside them, they are easier to use than having to constantly lift row covers from your plants. I personally appreciate the natural breaking gardening that comes in late fall and winter, but I'm also antsy to get started again in the spring. Hopefully some of these garden extenders will help you harvest more from your vegetable garden. Thanks for listening. I'm Teresa Golden from the Veggie Patch. Until next time, nature calls. You're listening to Nature Calls, conversations from the Hudson Valley. Stay tuned for The Cover Up. I am Tim Kennelty. And I'm Jean Thomas. And welcome to another edition of The Cover-Up, where we talk about vines and ground covers. What are we talking about today, Jean? Well, you're going to be talking about some annual vines. I am. And I'm talking about my favorite, sedums. Excellent. Let's get into it. Okay. So I'm going to talk about vines. Vines are just great, right? And we've talked about several perennial vines in the past that are wonderful, but some of them can be a bit overwhelming. As we review these choices, I think maybe we should consider some of the less permanent types. I'm talking about annual vines. There are really quite a few, and most are eager to colonize whatever you put them on to climb. In fact, if you plant annual vines, make sure you provide a support at the same time so you don't have to reel them in later and wrestle them onto their trellis, unless you like that kind of thing, of course. Being annuals, time is of the essence. If you're starting seeds, make sure you start them early enough so that they make a running start. If you're buying seedlings in packs, get the chunkiest plants you can. The ones that are stretching and escaping will only break your heart. They'll just sit around and sulk and not fill out until much later anyway. And don't be afraid to put in a couple of extra seedlings. Many retailers also make available the best shortcut of all, the teepee. It's a large pot with a teepee of bamboo sticks in it, with vines already planted and grown and flowering. Use normal caution about last frost dates, but it's instant gratification. They're ideal for a deck or open porch. You can stand a pot next to a trellis or arbor and let it climb even higher. And if done carefully, the root ball can be removed from the pot and planted into the ground. They'll grow robustly all summer and into the fall. Once killed off by frost, you can tear them out or do whatever you want with them. What are the best annual vines? My favorites are Morning Glory, Hyacinth Bean, or Lab Lab, and Moonflower, probably because they're the easiest and get pretty big. You can also collect the seed for the next season, which is great free plants. Morning glory is sometimes a mixed blessing. First of all, don't confuse them with wild morning glory or called bindweed. Terrible, terrible murder of a plant and never really gets pretty anyway. Morning glory comes in a gorgeous range of colors from sky blue to white to my favorite purple heirloom, Grandpa Ott. These will aggressively recede, and some people think of them as past. I let them thrive where I like them and mow them elsewhere. Easy peasy. Hyacinth bean is a gorgeous medley of purple from the leaves to the flower to the beautiful bean itself. And moonflower has a wonderful mystique of its own because, of course, it only blooms at night or on very cloudy days. It's a cousin to the morning glory and is technically a tender perennial. Grow it where you'll be able to see it at night and enjoy the fragrance. You might even get to see a visit from a luna moth. 
There are also some more exotic vines with dainty flowers like the yellow flowering canary creeper, which is a weak climber but worth the extra attention because the flowers look like canaries. The flowers of the cardinal climber, another cousin of the morning glory, are as you would expect bright red hummingbird magnets. I love this plant. The leaves are feathery and whole plants look fragile, but it's not a fragile plant. They can grow to 12 feet and look great combined with morning glory. Some vines like to be in containers, like hanging baskets. Maybe they're lazy, but black-eyed Susan vine, Thumbergia, look great trailing from a pot, and they can be white or orange in color. Acerina is a pretty blue bell of a flower that is sometimes called climbing snapdragon. I don't really see it. It trails beautifully and loves to drape over things like walls. And there are vines that even the nothing-but-veggies gardener will like. Scarlet runner beans, for example, will make a double crop if wanted. The young beans can be eaten just like green beans, and the mature pods produce beautiful dry beans for soups. And the flowers are a bonus because they attract pollinators and hummingbirds. Mine grow on an arch at the gate to my vegetable garden. Another trellis at the back of the garden is a deer barrier and supports my gourd vine. This is a visual treat with its beautiful white flowers that turn into dangling hard-shelled fall ornaments. You could grow bottle gourds or Turks turbans or loofah gourds. If you're determined to grow edible vines, remember cucumbers love to climb too. Or miniature pumpkins or tiny watermelons or it goes on and on. Jean, what are you going to tell us about ground covers today? Well, ground covers are wonderful because they're just like carpets. They hide stuff. Today's star is sedum. The sedum genus is a member of the Crassula family and so is the Sempervivum genus. I'm throwing in the Semper Vivums as a bonus because they behave the same way as sedums and expand your palate. Starting with the words, let's begin at the largest category. Crassulacea comes from the Latin word for thick because the leaves of the plants are so fleshy and thick. Sedum is from the Latin word for sit because that's exactly what the plants tend to do. They sit nice and low to the ground. Hence the popular name of stone crops as well. Semper Vivum means live forever. And the plants do have constant new baby plants growing from the adult plants. Once established, both sedums and sempervivums are hardy to zone 3 and usually evergreen. Their only known enemies are too much water and, rarely, snails. So why are we looking at plants that are thick and squatty? Because they're wonderfully tough and varied. Sedums and sempervivums, which are also known as hen and chicks, are drought-tolerant, heat-loving, low-growing plants that have many colors, both in their fleshy leaves and their bright masses of flowers. They're happy in poor soil, and they dislike too much moisture. Those fleshy leaves are excellent water storage units. They thrive where leafier plants wither and die. Think of hell strips, the spaces between sidewalk and curb, or alongside driveways. Thickly planted with sedums, they're neat, healthy, and mower-free. Areas where even grass refuses to grow can become attractive green areas, seasonally colorful with flowering. The infamous black walnut with its alleles preventing most things from growing has no effect on sedums, so you can finally cover that bare spot under the trees. Oh, did I mention deer and rabbits are rarely interested in sedums as a snack? Let me list a couple of the most popular sedums for you. There are 600 to 700 species in total and dozens are available for gardeners. Sedum acre comes first, and not just alphabetically. It's a primo ground cover that minds its own business and will spread wherever opportunities arise, but it's easy to rogue out and remove if unwanted. Its common name of gold moss is a perfect description. It stays low and green much of the season until it elongates a few inches in height and erupts with hundreds of tiny bright yellow flowers. These last a nice long time, and since they tolerate some shade, can be spectacular under a tree or covering a hot, dry slope. Another popular sedum is sedum spurium, or Caucasian sedum. It's also known as two-row sedum, which describes the way the round, scalloped leaves are arranged on the stems. There's a red-flowering version known as dragon's blood, and one with lime-colored leaves that sends up tall, pink-flowering stems. The leaves grow into a mat that can spread and cover as much or as little as you want. Other sedums are available in a vast array of leaf shape, leaf and flower color, and heights, although most stay low. 
Their cousins, the Sempervivum tectorum, are one of my favorite plants. Also known as house leeks or hens and chicks, they're a nearly indestructible plant to introduce kids to gardening. Basically, there's a main rosette of one plant, the hen, with a circle of smaller offset rosettes attached by leaders. When the hen is about three years old, it sends up a flower stalk, then dies off, leaving the chicks to expand the colony. The flowers aren't the draw, however. It's the great variety of sizes and colors and quirks like cobweb growths. They've been traditionally grown on roofs in Europe, and I've seen a new trend of green roofs rising with these cheerful little plants making the prettiest and most sustainable, along with their sedum cousins. They already have a track record. They don't require deep soil or frequent watering and weeding. They alleviate urban heat wells and slow down water runoff on garages and sheds. Well, now that I've strayed from a simple discussion of ground covers to green roofs, I may as well take the total plunge. Ground cover and rock garden stars, many sedums and sempervivums can also be grown as houseplants. They must have great quantities of light and limited amounts of water. Until next time, that's it for the cover-up. Thanks for listening. You're listening to Nature Calls, conversations from the Hudson Valley. Stay tuned for Flower Power. Welcome to Flower Power, a regular feature of this podcast that will focus on all things flowered. I am Linda Levitt, a Master Gardener volunteer with the Cornell Cooperative Extension of Columbia and Greene Counties in New York's Hudson Valley. Approximately once a month, we will cover different types of flowers, how to best select, plant, and care for each of the flowers featured. I am very excited about today's episode. These three plants grace our gardens well after all other plants have gone by. We will spend a few minutes talking about these three wonderful fall blooming plants. A very well-known plant, the chrysanthemum, a little less known option, the aster, and a not so well-known plant, my favorite perennial, the Montauk daisy. The chrysanthemum plant, commonly referred to as mums, were first cultivated in China as early as the 15th century BC. The plants were used as herbs and the roots and leaves were eaten. Its favorable reputation in the US is a welcome sight in late summer and early fall, appearing in grocery stores, farm markets and garden centers. However, this flower is not looked at the same way in some countries in Europe. Some European countries consider the chrysanthemum the flower of death, seeing these flowers only at funerals or laying on graves, a very morbid thought. There are actually two types of mums. One is an annual plant and the other a perennial plant. The annual plant is Chrysanthemum multicale and the perennial plant is the Chrysanthemum morifolium. If you are only using these plants in your fall display, It may not matter to you if it's an annual or a perennial. However, you should know that the perennial mum is easy to grow and welcome in your fall landscape. If your plant comes without identification, which most times they do, you can see the following differences between the annual and the perennial. Annual plants have thinner, strappy leaves that are not toothed. Perennial plant leaves are toothed, wider, and deeply notched. Perennial garden mums have smaller flowers than the annual potted variety. Chances are the potted mum that we're used to seeing at most garden centers and grocery stores are annual plants. So let's talk about the perennial plant. Perennial plants are hardy to agriculture zones five to nine, but will need some TLC to make it successfully through our winters. Do not plant them too late into the fall. Planting too late will not allow the root system to take hold. Potted plants will need to be deadheaded, removing all spent flowers and leaves, and planted in well-worked soil with good drainage. You can cut back the stems actually to two inches from the ground in late fall, or you can actually leave the stems until early spring. 
You may want to cover the crown of the plant with mulch or pine needles for extra protection. However, too much mulch around the stems actually cause rot. Pinch back the flower buds from early spring to mid-July every two weeks for tighter, more compact and better blooming plants. You must water them regularly and fertilize them in July. These are easy flowers to grow that will be a consistent performer in your garden. Now let's focus on the aster, probably not as well known as the chrysanthemum. The aster plant got its name from the Latin word for star. They are called the superstars of the fall garden. There are several hundred species of these plants available and some plants can reach as high as six feet tall. The flowers range in color from white and pink to the most striking lavender and sometimes even blue. The aster plant is native to the Eastern United States, including Virginia. Although native, it can be considered problematic that can easily become weedy in dry areas like pine forests, chaparrales, and deserts. The New England and New York varieties spread through underground runners and will reseed. So when you're planting, please keep that in mind. Asters can be grown in most growing conditions other than full shade. They prefer moist, well-drained soil. Some varieties need nutrient-rich soils while others need poor soil conditions. So you must know which variety you have. That's very important. Most asters need full sun in order to prevent flopping over. I know mine are flopping over this year, so I know they're not getting enough sun. There are some woodland varieties that can tolerate shade, but they do need morning sun. It is best to grow asters from a plant rather than from seed. Make sure to add mulch to keep the soil cool and prevent weeds and water generously. Remove spent flowers after the plant has finished blooming for the season. Watch for powdery mildew and rust disease in the leaves and removing those infected leaves and flowers if necessary. And last but not least, my favorite, the Montauk Daisy. A very little is known about this amazing plant. I cannot say enough good things about it. This plant is also called a Nippon Daisy. You will not see these plants available at your local garden center during the summer, probably mid-August, you'll see the plants available for sale. For years, the Montauk Daisy was classified as a chrysanthemum until recently when they received their own genus name. Nippon, as you might think, is generally used to name plants that originated in Japan. The Montauk Daisy is native to China and Japan. However, they were given their common name, the Montauk Daisy, because they have naturalized on Long Island near the town of Montauk. The plants are hardy to zone five to nine. I know they grow abundantly in my full sun garden. They look fantastic. They are now blooming. The flowers are pure white looking like a daisy as we know it with multiple flowers per stem. Flowers will appear from late summer to heavy frost. They do tolerate a light frost. In my garden, the flowers actually don't appear until September. They are just starting to bloom now, as a matter of fact. Just when you think they're not going to bloom, they do. They attract pollinators to the garden when most plants have actually died off. They are sometimes deer resistant and rabbit resistant. If the plants are small, mine got decimated by the rabbits. As the plants get larger, the wildlife is unable to keep up with the growth rate. The plants are very salt tolerant and drought tolerant, able to be planted near your driveway or road. That is why they are able to exist in abundance on the shores of Long Island. They require well-draining soil and full sun. Wet or damp soil or too much shade results in rot or fungal disease. They can grow as tall and as wide as three feet when left unattended. At this point, mine are now about four feet wide and about three feet tall. If they are getting a bit leggy during the summer season, you can pinch back the plants by actually cutting the plant back by half. I haven't tried this method and my plants seem to be okay, blooming profusely this time of year. During the summer months, the plant is very pretty. It looks like a big shrub with very glossy leathery leaves. 
After the plants are gone, I cut back the plant to about six inches above the ground and cover the crown of the plant with mulch for extra winter protection. I remove the mulch as soon as I start to see new growth in the spring. This is an amazing plant that brings excitement to your garden as all other plants are fading. They are very easy to grow and you will get so many years of enjoyment. I hope you have enjoyed this episode of Flower Power. Thank you for listening. You will find additional information for this episode on our website. Until the next time, I am Linda Levitt and please remember to stop and smell the flowers. That concludes another episode of Nature Calls, Conversations from the Hudson Valley. We would like to thank Sandra Linnell and Devin Connolly from Cornell Cooperative Extension of Columbia and Green Counties for production support. And a special thank you to our listeners for joining us on this episode of Nature Calls, Conversations from the Hudson Valley. You can find links to any of the topics mentioned in this episode at our website at ccecolumbiagreen.org. Comments and suggestions for future topics may be directed to us at columbiagreenmgb at cornell.edu or on the CCE Master Gardener Volunteers of Columbia and Green County's Facebook page. For more information about Cornell Cooperative Extension of Columbia and Green Counties, visit our website at ccecolumbiagreen.org or visit us in Hudson or in Acre. Cornell Cooperative Extension provides equal programming and employment opportunities 